And now I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today. Dr. Lauren F. Winner is the highly acclaimed author of Girl Meets God, Mudhouse Sabbath, and most recently, Real Sex, The Naked Truth About Chastity. I'm sure you're all going to listen. <laughs> the child of a Jewish father and a lapsed Southern Baptist mother, Dr. Winner became an Orthodox Jew at an early age. Over the years, as she observed Sabbath rituals and studied Jewish law, she found herself increasingly drawn to Christianity and eventually accepted Christ into her life. In Girl Meets God, Dr. Winter describes her search for religious identity and how she ultimately learned that faith takes practice and that belief is an ongoing challenge. Dr. Winter has spoken at Gordon College a number of times in recent years. After the class of 2007, heard her speak in a series of addresses in December 2006, they recommended to me that we invite Dr. Winner to be our commencement speaker today. Dr. Winner has appeared on PBS Religion and Ethics Newsweekly. She's written for the New York Times Book Review, the Washington Post World, Publishers Weekly, and Christianity and Christian Century, Christianity Today and Christian Century. Dr. Winner holds the BA from Columbia College and a doctorate in the history of American religion from Columbia University. She also holds a Master's of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge and a Master's of Divinity from Duke Divinity School. She lives in Durham, North Carolina with her husband, Griff Gatewood. Let's welcome Dr. Winner to our podium. Thank you. President and Mrs. Kahlberg, Gordon College trustees, faculty, staff, and especially students and families of students, I am deeply honored and, and very grateful for the invitation to be with you on this very special morning. This is my third, I think, formal visit to Gordon. I've made a few informal visits over the years as well. And each time I come here, I come away more impressed than the last time and always very encouraged about the future of the church and the world. So thank you for your hospitality on this occasion and on occasions in the past. Well, graduating students, about 10 years, eight days, and three hours ago, I roughly was sitting where you sit. I was about to be graduated from college. It was actually my first graduation. I am a high school dropout, technically, according to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, <laughs> I may be the first high school dropout to ever speak at a Gordon College commencement, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's a, a classic anxiety dream that people sometimes have in which they have to go back to high school and take some test in a class they haven't attended. I have that anxiety dream a lot. Um, when you haven't actually graduated, it has a little more bite, that dream. At my own college commencement 10 years ago, I was slightly thrilled and I was slightly nervous and I was also a little sad. I wondered in all honesty what exactly it meant that I was graduating from college. I wondered if it meant that I was finally going to be an adult. I wondered if it meant that I would be able to find a job. Barring that, I wondered how I was going to pay the rent because my parents were certainly not going to keep doing that for me. I wondered what my graduation from college meant for my relationship with my family. Part of the exhilaration and terror that attended that college graduation came from the fact that in some sense, I and my classmates were being launched. Now, we had been living real lives up to that point. Our childhoods and our college years were part of our real life. But the emotions that I think always accompany commencement ceremonies are owed in part to the recognition that students have been preparing. And now, here at this commencement, 
you are being launched into that thing for which you have prepared. Your teachers and your parents and your siblings and your friends, we have all gathered to launch you. That is, after all, why this ceremony is called commencement. It is the ceremony of conferring degrees and granting diplomas that happens at the end of an academic year. But we don't call the ceremony ending or culmination or completion. We call it commencement, which we can think of as an English synonym for the Hebrew word bereshit, which is the first word of the Bible. It means in the beginning. The excitement and terror of graduation exercises comes from the recognition that something here is beginning, some new adult thing, and that is exciting and terrifying. I will say that <clears throat> I have absolutely no recollection of what the speaker at my college commencement said. I remember that the speaker was Jonathan Kozel, who is a terrific teacher and a fabulous writer and a, a powerful and important anti-poverty activist. And I remember that the speech was terrific. But what exactly he talked about, I don't have a clue. I did come home a couple of weeks ago to find a voicemail from my grandmother asking me to call her urgently. I thought something bad had happened. And, and all she wanted to know was if she correctly remembered that Jonathan Kozel had been my great commencement speaker because he was going to be speaking in her hometown. She wanted to hear him again. She also didn't remember what he had said at my college commencement. <laughs> And when I asked a few friends of mine who are graduates of Gordon College if they had any advice for this commencement address, the unanimous advice was keep it short. People want their diplomas. They want to get to their lunch reservations at the Black Cow and Alchemy. They do not want to hear you drone on and on and on. <laughs> Especially true, perhaps, given that many of you are seated on bleachers, which admittedly is better than sitting in the 40 degree drizzle. So I will try to be brief. The question most frequently asked at college graduations is, what are you doing now? What are you doing next now that you've graduated? And many of you have really exciting answers to those questions. And you should relish those answers. You're going to graduate school. You're doing inner city mission work. You're teaching English abroad. You're going to Israel on a Fulbright. You're establishing households with spouses or friends. You're buying a suit and heading off to a glamorous job in Boston. You have done wonderful work here at Gordon, and you are about to go do wonderful work in the world. And for both of those, you are to be hugely and terrifically congratulated. But today is not only a celebration of your terrific accomplishment, it is also a day to give gratitude for the powerful intellectual and spiritual formation you have received here at Gordon. The world beyond these halls is, as you know, not a big bad place. It is a big wonderful place. But it is a place filled with some challenges for those who would lead a life of faith. Gordon has invited you to organize your lives around Christian community and intellectual freedom. You have, for the last few years, helped create a community designed to help wisdom enter your heart a community that has helped shape you into people who, in the language of Proverbs, find knowledge pleasing. That knowledge and that formation has been hard won. You have made many sacrifices for the education you have received, as have your teachers and parents. And I hope that none of us ever forgets that the educations we have are a terrific, terrific privilege. In the Christian world, we sometimes often unwittingly use the language of inside and outside. We sometimes think of ourselves as being inside safe Christian institutions, and those are juxtaposed with the world that is outside. In my writing and in my everyday life, I usually bend over backwards to avoid those dichotomies of inside and outside. I think it's a little worrying for Christians to use that inside-outside language, in part because thinking about insiders and outsiders readily leads us to think about us and them. 
I usually try to help myself and my fellow Christians remember that culture is part of God's good creation and that Christians are not just supposed to hang out with other Christians in our safe Christian communities. We are supposed to live saltily in the world. But during the last few weeks, as I thought about your graduation ceremonies this weekend, I couldn't help feeling that part of what was happening today was a movement from inside to outside. A movement from a vibrant campus community that is organized around the priorities of Christian discipleship to a wide, wide world that is too often organized around profit motive. A world that will ask you to define yourself not by your relationship to God, but by your relationship to your accomplishments. When the world asks you what's on tap after graduation, the world wants an answer keyed to productivity, success, and accomplishment. Now, on paper, I guess I've been pretty successful in the decade since I graduated from college. I have earned three more degrees from fancy universities, thereby meeting my goal of becoming the most highly educated high school dropout ever. <laughs> I've published some books. I've landed my dream job. When I graduated from college, I had a set of goals, and I've more or less accomplished them. And yet, when I reflect over the last 10 years of my life, I realize that the things that people see when they look at my resume are not really the most important things. The important things are far more intimate. I have taught pre-K Sunday school at my church. I have tried and often failed to be a good sister and a good wife. I have helped my mother die, which was not what I expected to spend my 26th year of life doing, but it was much more important than anything on my resume. If I could offer you one hard-earned bit of wisdom from my post-college decade, it would be this. Remember that Jesus came to give us life more bountiful, not life more accomplished or more productive. Resist the world's temptations to measure the worth of your days by your productivity, and measure yourself instead by the fullness and richness of your life by the extent that you live into the true bounty that Jesus promises us. Remember in the world what this college has taught you, that our calling is to love God with our hearts and souls and our minds and our bodies, that we are to find our way to God through and in Christian community, that in all we are to do, we are to be cross-bearers and kingdom proclaimers. In her recent book, Blue Arabesque, the memoirist Patricia Hempel records a conversation that she has with a 60-year-old nun, a nun who entered a cloistered convent at age 19. Can you tell me, Patricia Hempel asked her, what the essence of your life is? The nun answered with one word, leisure, she said. Patricia Hempel was a little bit taken aback. She was expecting, as I would have been expecting from a 60-year-old nun, an answer that was a little more stern and serious and pious. I think she was expecting the nun to say, the essence of my life is prayer, or the essence of my life is time with God. So Patricia Hempel sat there with a blank look on her face, and finally the nun elaborated. She said, leisure, because it takes time to do this. That is, the things that matter in life require that we find some space in a world that defines us by what we produce and what we spend. It takes time to do this. It takes time, leisure, and space to settle into adulthood. It takes time, leisure, and space to follow Christ into and in the world. You are leaving a community that has taught you to gaze deeply at the things that matter, a community organized around teaching people to think clearly, to gaze deeply, and to see well. And you are entering a world that will ask you to do everything quickly, that will ask you to glimpse rather than to gaze. I was 20 when I graduated from college, and I have to say that I have found my 20s really confusing.
I have constantly felt that I am on some huge journey and that no one has given me a map. I have had these gargantuan questions before me, questions about jobs and schools and dating and marriage and money and geography and God. These are big questions. I think that one's 20s can be terrific but also stressful. To be honest, I'm a little worried about my 30s as well. I'm really looking forward to my 40s and 50s where I figure everything will have settled down by that point. <laughs> Which may be foolish, but I'm going to carry on in that optimistic belief. Anyway, I think these feelings that I have often had and that I sometimes still have, that I have been without a road map, are essentially correct. We are living in a time of great social transformation a time of great geopolitical change and technological change. On top of that, we are living in the middle of one of the great social revolutions of human history, that is the revolution in how we think about gender, how we think about men and women and their roles. Furthermore, many of us younger Americans feel for the first time in US history that economically, not to mention environmentally, we may be considerably less well off than the generation that came before us. We live at a moment where although in some ways the stakes have never been higher, the privileged in our society often lead lives of childish nihilism, as though there were no stakes at all. As Toni Morrison recently said, while children are being eroticized into adults, adults are being exoticized into eternal juvenilia. We live at a scary time. The world has shown itself to be a scary place in the years since you have entered college. America has shown itself to be both more and less powerful than we knew. Terrifically important challenges await you on the other side of this commencement ceremony. Some of those challenges, like stewarding creation and saving the planet, are so awesome that just thinking about them makes my heart race. And some of those challenges are smaller and more intimate, but also hugely significant. The challenge of living attentively in a world that tells us to multitask and the challenge of living lives of holy intention in a world that values haste. A few minutes ago, we heard a brief reading from the book of Proverbs. The reading we heard came from chapter two of Proverbs, and it is a passage that encourages us to turn our ear to wisdom. Well, that passage is appropriate for our purposes here today because what you have done for four years is turn your ear to wisdom. But consideration of Proverbs is also appropriate today because Proverbs is a book whose task is similar to the task that now lies before you as you commence post-college life. Proverbs does offer a road map of sorts. It is a road map that directs us to the everyday, to the ordinary. It is a road map that insists that God's wills and God's ways are learned in part by observation of God's creation. And the task of the book of Proverbs, like the task before all of us, is to try to figure out how to live so that things will go well and it is to try to understand things that are hard to understand. So Proverbs insists that a life well lived plays out on the register of the quotidian and the ordinary and the relational. It is interested in why families do or don't get along, why friends stab us in the back, and why we can love someone and hate the same person at the same time. I don't have a road map more precise than Proverbs to give you. I wish that I did. What I can give you is a story. And it is a story that contains the best piece of advice I have ever received. The story takes place about three years after I graduated from college. And I was then sitting in a coffee shop in New York City. Um, since all I really do in life is read and have conversations with people, my stories are not usually said anywhere more exciting than that. I was there meeting with a minister, a priest named Margot, and I wanted to meet with her because I was wondering if I was being called to become an ordained minister as well. And I felt sort of urgent about figuring that out. So Margot patiently listened to me 
almost work myself up into a state of, I think, quasi-hysteria about this question of whether I was supposed to go be a priest. After suggesting that I perhaps did not need more caffeine, she then said, Lauren, in making this decision, you just have one job. Your job is to figure out what to pay attention to and then pay attention to it. Now, that sounds like a truism, but it is actually the best thing anyone has ever said to me over coffee in a Starbucks. For the last four years, your jobs have included a huge array of tasks. They've included learning to get along well with your roommate, figuring out how to relate to your parents now that you're living on your own, taking classes, studying, showing up for exams. You've done your jobs terrifically well, and that is why we have all come to celebrate and launch you. And now in this scary and wonderful world beyond the halls of Gordon, your job is both simpler and more complex than it has ever been. Your job is to figure out what to pay attention to and then pay attention to it. I am a writer, which means I am essentially a believer in meaning. I believe there is meaning in the world and that it is our efforts, our attentive efforts, to locate and shape that meaning in which we find our most bountiful lives. I believe that the act of attending to that which deserves our time and respect is one of the most faithful and radical things we can do. I remember being told when I was in college that these college years were the best years of my life. That is hogwash. <laughs> college is great, but what comes after college is even better. It is terrifying and it often feels road mapless, but it is even better than college. What comes after are years of refinement, maturing, gratitude, and holy struggle. What comes after is a long unfolding season in which you are given the opportunity to do that which you have been equipped to do, to figure out what to pay attention to and then to pay attention to it. For the attentive, faithful, bountiful lives you have led thus far, I am very thankful. And for the attentive, faithful, and bountiful lives that commence as you leave this place, I am grateful. This scary, broken, redeemed, blessed, holy, painful, magical world needs you. Thank you.